From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to welcoming you back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Being ultimately connected to the water, sailors see firsthand the many impacts on our oceans that man is having, from ocean pollution to oil spills to habitat destruction. Sailors for the Sea, powered by Oceana, engages in, educates, and activates the sailing and boating community toward restoring ocean health. Director Shelley Brown and Program Manager Emily Conklin are with us today to share how sailors and boaters can take action to protect our oceans and waterways through their clean regattas and clean boating programs. Whether you're new to green boating or have been environmentally minded for decades, you will learn about sustainable regattas and practical tips on how to protect the waters we love to sail. So Shelley and Emily, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much for the introduction, Ron, and the invitation to speak today. We're so happy to be here and share um, information about green boating and clean regattas. We also want to thank Meg Ruxton for bringing you guys to us today. She introduced us to the sea to many of us at the St. Francis Yacht and we're uh, proud to champion your case and think it's better for all of us, not just, you know, sailors, but fishermen and swimmers and surfers and everybody who enjoys the beautiful, beautiful ocean that we have. And we want to keep it beautiful. Okay, so I'm Shelly, and I'm going to kick us off today to talk about how sailors and boaters as individuals and as a community can take action to protect our oceans. So as Ron mentioned, Sailors from the Sea, powered by Oceana, is a leading ocean conservation organization that focuses on inspiring, activating, and engaging sailors and boaters towards restoring the health of our oceans and waterways. And we're both based in Newport, Rhode Island, but we work with sailors across the globe. And we have four core programs to help us engage with the sailing and boating community. Through our Green Boating Initiative, we have provided sailors and boaters the knowledge, tools, and resources to make eco-smart decisions on the water that will have immediate impact for our seas. And so I'll be sharing a few green boating tips today. Our second and probably most well-known program is called Clean Regattas. Clean Regattas is a sustainability certification for any water-based event. We provide a framework and support for events to reduce their environmental impact from eliminating single-use items to preventing toxins from entering the water. And Emily is going to dive into this program and share the significant steps that St. Francis Yacht Club and the Rolex Big Boat Series is taking to be sustainable. And then our two other programs are KELP and our Skippers Volunteer Program. Our KELP program is our kids education program, which consists of over 50 um, marine science activities that are free and downloadable online. And they help kids discover you know, what's happening under their holes and learn about ocean health issues like plastic pollution and overfishing. And we created this program um, for sailing instructors to use on a no wind or rainy day um, because they help kids start learning about ocean science. And um, yes, yeah, so that's our kids education program. And then our skippers volunteer program is our newest program. We have 16 skippers that are based in the United States and Canada. And they're kind of our boots on the ground who are empowering their local sailing communities to join our programs and to take action to protect their waterways. So as I mentioned, we'll be talking about the first two, green boating and clean regattas. So I'm sure like many other boaters, while you're on the water, you see the destruction humans are having on our oceans. Mylar balloons, water bottles, plastic bags, all types of plastic waste floating in the water. Maybe you've seen sea level rise or hurricane damage happening in your harbor or marina due to the impacts of climate change. Or even oil spills and runoff negatively impacting coastal ecosystems or perhaps even harm to marine wildlife, like this whale that's entangled in fishing gear. And it can be disheartening as boaters to see issues on the water. But witnessing these issues firsthand, we as boaters have a powerful voice to advocate for our oceans. 
We can do things as individuals, like I mentioned, and as, on our own boats and in our lives, um, and as communities of boaters. So as Ron mentioned, whether you're new to green boating or you've been eco-friendly for many years, um, I hope you come away learning a few new tips and um, practical information that you can implement on your boat or at home. And so before we dive into some green boating tips, I wanted to share that all of these tips and a lot more information is found in our green boating guide. Um, if you go to this link here, you can sign up and you'll receive a free digital copy. And our green boating guide covers 28 different topics and they're all found on our website as well. So how can we as boaters protect our waterways? At Sailors from the Sea, we spend obviously spend a lot of time thinking about this. Today, what I'm going to focus on is the things that have the biggest impact. So I've categorized these tips under three overarching green boating practices that I'm gonna call the three Bs. So first, be careful about what goes into the water. Next, be aware of wildlife and habitat. And finally, be an advocate for our oceans. So if you take a step back and think about all the different types of things that can go into the water, it's a pretty long list. It can be soapy water from cleaning your boat, sewage discharge, um, small spills from filling up your fuel tank, uh, pumping out your bilge, sunscreens, or the gray water from showering or cleaning your dishes. And there are ways that we can minimize what ends up in the water or try to make sure that what ends up in the water is less likely to harm the environment. So I'm gonna talk about three different potential pollutants that may end up in our waterways and what we can do about them. I'm sure many of you recognize this symbol and are well aware of the issue. Black water or sewage discharge has many negative impacts on our coastal ecosystems. Excess nutrients going into the water can cause algal blooms, which can lead to dead zones or areas of no oxygen. Um, black water can also carry disease causing organisms, which can be bad for swimmers or for the shellfish that we like to eat. And then there's chemicals that we might add to our toilets or holding tanks that can also be toxic to marine life. So what can we do about black water on board? Obviously, you want to use your toilets and holding tanks appropriately. Um, here in the U.S., all recreational boats in, um, with installed toilet facilities are required by the Coast Guard to have an operable marine sanitation device or MSD. And if you're in a no discharge zone and you have a holding tank that can go out into the waterway, you need to make sure your Y valve is in the off, secured in the off position. We also just talked a couple weeks ago to some sailors and they've installed a composting toilet on board the boat. So there's a lot of different options to, to kind of prevent or be careful about black water entering your water. But another key to managing black water is knowing where your pump out stations or pump out boats are in your region and where you might plan to travel. So maybe you're planning a trip or chartering a boat in the Caribbean. They might not have pump out stations available. So you wanna make sure that you're at least three miles offshore before you dump any sewage into the water. And finally, do your research ahead of time. Knowing locations of no discharge zones is really important. So here's a map in California, San Francisco here, and the blue is a no discharge zone for larger vessels. I think California has one of the largest no discharge zones for large vessels. So you can easily Google where the no discharge zones, where are the pump out stations in my region, and they, they will pop up for you. If you're in a marina, I'm sure you've all seen this, this colorful rainbow. Filling up our tanks is one of the most common way that we unintentionally pollute our waterways. And even a tiny spill can be toxic to our waters, harming both animals and plants. Just one pint of oil or fuel dumped into the water can make a, a football size oil slick, which is huge. So the small spills really do add up. So what can we do about preventing fuel from sneaking into the ocean? First, you wanna check your fuel lines and tanks for any damage. Next, you wanna know the capacity of your fuel tank and how much fuel you'll need to be filling. Fuel tanks are not pressurized like car fuel tanks, so the pump automatic shutoff nozzle rarely works. You can also install a warning whistle device in the fill and you can hear, it makes a, like a warbling noise when it's starting to get close. You can also install a fuel air separator and in line. This collapses the foam and returns it to the tank and prevents surges in overfilled tanks. 
You can also buy and use absorbent products to catch potential spills. So they have little bibs that go can go around your fuel intake or a collar here that's pictured in this photo here that can go around the fuel nozzle and that will pick up any small spills that might come out of your tank. You can also store a spill kit on board and use it if needed. And putting a absorbent pad in your bilge can also be really helpful at collecting oil and fuel before you pump out your bilge. Finally, you want to be cautious with portable fuel cans. It's a really easy way to accidentally um, get fuel into the water. You try to make sure that you're on a steady surface if possible, and that can help prevent any potential spills. Next, this is a topic that we get a lot of questions about is cleaning products. So we all want to keep our boats, you know, the inside and the outside of our boats in tip top condition, but many cleaning products are actually harmful to our waters and to aquatic life. Some chemicals can damage fish tissues, other chemicals can create those nutrient imbalances that lead to algal blooms. And actually, most cleaning products are made to not to be directly released into our waterways. And they're actually created to go through wastewater treatment facilities where the majority of contaminants and chemicals are removed before the water goes back into rivers, lakes, and the ocean. So how can we reduce the impact of cleaning products? This can be really overwhelming and challenging. It can be overwhelming to find the right eco-friendly product. So I'm hoping that I can give you some advice on what we can do while we're cleaning and how to find the, the right cleaner. So first, try to regularly rinse your boat and boat parts with fresh water. So it's less likely that grime and dirt will accumulate and hopefully you can get that clean cleaner faster. You can also, it might not be feasible for everybody, but hopefully you can potentially use designated washdown areas for lots of boat parts like your life jackets or other items, potentially boats. Some marinas have designated washdown areas. Sometimes you can use grass too, which can help absorb runoff. And this is a great way to prevent the chemicals from going directly into our waterways. And then you wanna choose cleaning products that are less harmful to the environment. This is probably the most challenging part because manufacturers are not required to list the ingredients of their products on their cleaners. And the words like all natural, green, eco-friendly, are not regulated. So people can put those words on their bottles and it might not have a meaning. But our Green Boating Guide has some research from the Boat US Foundation and they did a lot of different testing to most environmentally friendly cleaning products. So we have some suggestions there. You can also check your products on Safer Choice website through the EPA. And then finally, try to use your cleaning products sparingly or follow the directions on your bottle. Some people just dump a lot and that can cause, cause more damage. So those are kind of our suggestions on how to protect our oceans from cleaning products. And next I wanna to move to our next B. So one of the many joys that I particularly have, but I think a lot of people have while they're boating is being out in nature and seeing all the different types of wildlife and habitat that you may experience. And as boaters, there are steps that we can take to preserve and protect our coastal ecosystems and marine wildlife. So for example, we can anchor properly near sensitive habitats like seagrass beds or shellfish beds and coral reefs. But today I really want to focus on interacting or being close to wildlife. So it's important to know first what animals are found in your region from seabirds to sea turtles to whales and knowing that some species are migratory, so they may only be in your region for certain times during the year. Seabirds also might have important nesting grounds that you should know about. Just knowing the animals that are in your region can be fun to try to look for them as well. A good rule of thumb is to remain at least 300 feet away and limit your viewing time to 30 minutes. And if you're sailing your whale, first drop your sails and turn on your auxiliary engine. This will allow you to have more maneuverability and control over your boat if you have an engine they are more likely to be able to hear where you're located. You also want to avoid a head-on approach because the whale's eyes are on the side of their head, not in front of them. And you never know when they go down where they're going to be coming back up. And finally, as boaters, we can be eyes on the water. We can report entangled, endangered, or dead marine animals. Here in the U.S., we can call the Coast Guard and let them know, which can be really helpful. And this I wanted to show you because I thought it was a pretty eye-opening image. So it's a screenshot from the Whale and Dolphin Conservation. And there is a whale in this image. Can you see its head and tail? Here they are. So you can barely make them out. And this is on a flat, calm day. And here is the North Atlantic right whale, which is critically endangered. They lack a dorsal fin. They move very slowly at the surface of the water. And one of the leading threats to the species is ship strikes. 
So it's important to be aware of your surroundings so you can protect these whales and also your, your boat and yourself as well. So finally, the last B I wanted to discuss is being an advocate for our oceans. There's a lot of things that boaters can do to be a voice. You can be a part of citizen science projects, collecting data about our oceans. You can share messages with your community, and you can also take action on a specific issue. So the one I just wanted to focus on is a topic that really resonates with, with sailors and boaters, and that's plastic pollution. So 33 billion pounds of plastic enter the ocean every year. That's equivalent to two garbage trucks of plastic being dumped into the ocean every single minute. Plastics have been found uh, floating in the middle of the ocean, on remote islands, at the deepest point of the ocean floor. They're in our drinking water, in our beer. They're everywhere. And plastic waste is just increasing. What the problem comes down to is that companies are producing way too much throwaway plastic. So before I dive into some solutions, I just wanted to share a couple of plastic myths. The first myth is that all plastics are recyclable. I'm sure many of you have seen those three chasing arrows that form a triangular loop and saw it on an item and thought, hey, that this package is, can, and will be recycled. But that's not necessarily the case. So obviously this slide is very complicated, but that's the point of this slide. Each number represents a different category of plastics. So for example, the ones are the clear plastics. So like your water bottle or plastic or soft drink bottle. The fours are the plastic food wrappers that are thin and flexible. And the number sixes are styrofoam, like takeout containers or egg trays. And the final one, uh, seven is, you know, aptly named other. So if it doesn't fit into any of those categories, it goes into number seven. What you can see on the right-hand side is that the fours, sixes, and sevens are rarely recyclable. The threes and fives are often not recyclable. And the ones and twos are recyclable, but they're not recycled in any significant amount, which leads me to my next myth is that recycling is an effective solution to the plastic pollution crisis. It's not. As you just saw, there are many different types of plastic. There's plastics that are not recyclable. And if those different types of plastic go into our waste stream, they can contaminate it. And when plastics are recycled, they're actually downcycled to a product of lesser value. So out of all the plastic waste ever produced, only 9% has been effectively recycled. So I know many boaters are already doing our part to reduce and reuse and rethink our consumption of throwaway plastics, but I'm gonna share a few tips on what you can do as an individual and then how we can make a difference as a community. So first, if you, you wanna use your water filtration system or water maker on board so that you don't need to bring lots of plastic bottles on board. Next, you can replace a lot of single use items with reusables. A lot of people are already doing their water bottles, but you can do your dinnerware, what you package your food in, forks and knives, all different types of items, and just making sure that you're using something that will be reusable. And then you can shop smart and support plastic-free companies. So you can shop at your local farmer's market, for example, and like less likely to have plastic there. You can buy in bulk and then keep your plastic at home where there's less plastic packaging. You can also support companies that are coming up with innovative solutions. Toothpaste comes in a plastic container. There's a company that has made little tabs that you can chew instead of having a plastic container. And these are contained in glass and you can send it back to the company and they refill it and send it back to you. So there's a lot of innovation happening here and it's great to be able to support those companies. And then you can also on that note, shop at refillable places. So like I just mentioned, there's the, the plastic, the toothpaste, you can do refillables, but there's a lot of places where you can get your shampoo, sunscreen, even different food items in refillable containers. And then finally, sharing your voice is important. We can support policies that are going to make a difference for our so we can, if there's like a policy that's happening on the local, state, or national level that is helping to ban unnecessary single-use items, we can support those, those policies and be a voice, a voice for, for our oceans. So to wrap up, if you're interested in learning more about green boating tips, so you can head to the, our link here sailorsforthesea.org slash W-Y-L, and you can learn about all of these tips are in, will be in the green boating guide. And like I said, you'll receive our free digital green boating guide with that link. And now I'm going to turn it over to Emily, who's going to share how communities of sailors are making a difference for our seas. Thank you, Shelly, and thank you, Ron. So glad to be here talking about these exciting initiatives that we have at Sailors for the Sea. And as Shelly said, I'm going to be focusing on our Queen Regattas program, which pulls on a lot of the same concepts that Shelly just highlighted from our green boating guide and works those concepts into a community-based model so that we can work together to make our events and our clubs more sustainable for the oceans. So since 2006, our Clean Regattas program 
has supported over 3,000 events worldwide in their commitment to sustainability. The Clean Regatta program is a voluntary self-assessment tool and award certification from the participant level all the way up to the platinum level. Any on the water, near the water, or water loving event is eligible to register. It's not just regattas. We have paddle events and other things of that of that nature as well. Once you register, you receive our support in turning that event into one that's better for participants, the community, and for the planet. So organizers get our clean regatta toolkit, which outlines 20 best practices and guidance on how to achieve each of those. These practices are rooted in five interconnected sustainability themes, and I'm going to go through each of those as we move forward in the presentation. So first, I just want to say a little bit about the Rolex Big Boat series, which I will focus on throughout the rest of this presentation. So since 2016, this event at your own St. Francis Yacht Club has been certified as a clean regatta, starting out pretty high at the gold level and then growing to the platinum level. So the 2022 event this year will be the third year as a platinum level event. Platinum, as I said, is our highest level of certification, which means this event achieved at least 19 out of our 20 best practices. We know that the Rolex Big Boat Series achieved every best practice last year and are planning to do the same this year. So I will share their examples, the examples from their event um, as we move forward through all of the best practices. But I want to highlight a couple here that they, may, they focus on that can make a huge difference in the success of any event. So first of all, as I have listed here, Forming a green team is vital to the success of any sustainable event. The St. Francis Yacht Club Sustainability Subcommittee helps to map out choices that the event can make and then execute and monitor those practices throughout the event itself. We always say that no one can coordinate a clean regatta on their own. Um, involving your community helps the event to run more smoothly and allows you to achieve more than if you try to do this on your own. We also encourage or regattas or events to partner with local organizations to educate attendees and to support these sustainability practices, which can help to activate the community of folks who are involved with the regatta to make a difference for the ocean beyond just this one event. So our first category of best practices in the Clean Regattas Toolkit is the elimination of single-use items. So as Shelley talked about, Single-use plastics are a huge issue um, in terms of ocean health, and this category is focused around moving away from single-use plastics, but also just single-use in general, moving towards reusables so that anything that is being used at the regatta or at the event could potentially, hopefully, be used for multiple multiple years. In the example of the Rolex Big Boat series, uh, West Marine provided water refill stations and the club uh, has upgraded all the water fountains um, to include a bottle refill and they encourage sailors to use these in order to cut down on single use water bottle usage. Um, and then as you can see, so that's the top photo there, the water bottle refill station. And then as you can see on the bottom here, our fifth best practice item is about awards and encouraging regattas to award practical items or use a perpetual or upcycled trophy. And as you can see in this photo at the Rolex Big Boat Series, they do have perpetual trophies and also awarded practical use items to the winners. Our next area of best practices is community involvement. So as we noted previously, galvanizing your community to help run your clean regatta is one of the best ways to ensure success, especially if you're aiming to do every single best practice. Some ways to do this are getting the word out about your sustainability efforts, involving uh, local organizations, using reusable educational signage, and serving food local to your area. So in the 2021 Rolex Big Boat series, they were able to accomplish these things and include local organizations such as the San Francisco Baykeeper Organization. So this is the top photo here on the slide. And they were able to educate attendees specifically on the health of this region of the San Francisco Bay and, and their work to keep it pollution free and healthy. Food served was also sourced sustainably. And I love this best practice because 
it makes me kind of hungry. I wish I were enjoying this meal. So all of these seafood options were rated through the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch so that they could ensure that these were sustainably harvest, harvested food options. Uh, continuing along this theme, as I said, having your green team is really very important for success. And so this is point number 10 under our next category of responsible waste management. So especially at an event, the scale of the big boat series, it would be too big of an undertaking for one or even a couple of people to be able to achieve these practices successfully. So having a green team allows you to delegate so that folks can work on areas that they actually have a skill set for or are really passionate about and also allows these pieces to be executed more effectively. Uh, this is especially true for what's happening during the event when there are tons of participants and, and lots of action going on. We see the utility of this, especially during under the diverting food waste from landfill properly. So this is from best practices 10 through 12. And as you can see on the bottom, two pictures here. The Big Boat series uses three bin system for recycling, composting, and landfill waste. So if attendees haven't seen this before, they might not know what goes in which bin. And having your green team stationed at these three bin uh, system waste stations will ensure that folks are putting their waste in the right place. And that's helpful because they both will understand better why we do this, what goes where, and also will lower contamination of both recycling and compost, ensuring that these items are actually effectively dealt with in a sustainable way. All right, moving forward, um, the best practices in our environmental stewardship section encourage the involvement of our attendees or the events attendees in making sustainable choices for the health of our oceans and coasts. Hopefully they'll take that beyond the event and will turn into ocean advocates beyond just the regatta. So activities like a beach or marina cleanup or encouraging folks to bike or take public transportation to the event demonstrate that each person can make choices that will have a positive impact um, overall. This, as I mentioned before, the San Francisco Baykeeper Organization was a part of the Big Boat series last year. And in uh, relation to best practice number 16, the, they distributed information about their efforts to protect the Bay and International Ocean Film Festival also had information about programs that educate on conservation um, through films. So there was really a wide variety offered um, at this event. And they also had a speaker involved, um, Miranda Wang, who was the winner of the Rolex Award for Enterprise, about who um, shared about their work in technology to turn plastic waste into useful raw materials, so really looking at a circular economy. And then another tasty image, the last piece is to offer vegetarian or vegan alternatives, which are more common and easier to do now than ever. And as you can see in the top photo, um, these were offered at the Big Boat series last year as well. Right, and our final section, practices 18 through 20, are about green boating. So as we know, Shelley discussed this in detail, um, a big area of focus at Sailors for the Sea is encouraging green boating. And these are also incorporated into our Clean Regattas program to try and make each regatta more efficient. Um, regattas implement practices to have fewer boats under power in the water, such as using robotic buoys for course markers and having viewing sections set up so that spectators can see the action of the regatta from off the water and instead of jetting around in the water. So as you can see from this top photo, that is what the Big Boat series did last year. This can also be another opportunity for collaboration with other um, organizations. So as you can see in this second photo, the Baykeeper organization shared specific to San Francisco guidelines um, that relate to the green voting practices to maintain a healthy bay and highlight local pollution threats to make sure that uh, those are being executed throughout the event and hopefully by voters after the event as well. Uh, so all in all, this is the summation of our Clean Regattas program, which, as I said, it's a voluntary certification process that's designed to make it easy to support growth of sustainable events. Many events, including the Rolex Big Boat series that we, at St. Francis that we've been talking about today, return annually and climb the ladder to a higher level of certification, which we 
love to see. Uh, our toolkit helps guide the process. And of course, I, we are here every step of the way to help. And we have found wonderfully that once events get on board as a clean regatta, this is a catal this could be a catalyst for lasting change in the club or in, in the recurring series. So once people check off some of these boxes, they want to continue and, and do more. So we want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to share these programs with you today. We really believe that sailors and boaters are key players in protecting the oceans and our coastal ecosystems. Due to the threats that Shelley described and more, we all need to take action to, to protect the ocean. Our green boating guide and our clean regattas program are two ways folks invested in the water can also invest in the health of the environment. So we're so thrilled to share that with you and thank you again for having us. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. A couple of questions. In 2004, when David Rockefeller, fellow IOD owner, founded Sailors for the Sea in Northeast Haba, as they say, Maine, <laughs> a couple of beautiful IODs. And can you tell us about the size of your activity? Because it's such a wonderful, wonderful effort. How many people are in your staff? How much money have you guys raised? Tell us about it. Yeah, I'm happy to. So Sailors for the Sea was founded in 2004 by David Rockefeller Jr. and his really good friend, Dr. David Treadway. It's grown. So it started up in Northeast Harbor with a, just a few small regattas. And now we work with events in 50 different countries across the globe. 850,000 sailors have participated in the Clean Regatta program. And it's really, truly having an impact on our oceans. We have some really cool calculations of how much single-use plastic these events have, have stopped from polluting the waters. It's just been really, really exciting to see the growth. How much, give, it, give us some metrics on your effect. Yeah, I think, I believe in the last five years alone, six million single-use plastic water bottles have been prevented from entering our oceans and, and ending up in the landfill as well, so, or polluting the environment. Okay, so now one of the dilemmas that face us every day is when we look at the recycling bin at any regatta or even in the grocery store, we don't know what to put where. Where do you put a little milk carton if you consume the juice or milk, whatever is in it? It's kind of cardboardy, plastic, wax surface. Where do you throw that? That can be really difficult because it can be different based on where you live. So especially, Shelly said, you know, we operate worldwide and it's that varies significantly from country to country. But where we are in Rhode Island and probably similarly to where you are in San Francisco, uh, that would go in the recycling, so any carton can be recycled. And so how many people across the country are part of Sailors for the Sea? You guys are the organizers, you're a, pro a program director and a director of it, Shelley. Are there 100 people? Are there 16? Are there how many people are involved? Yeah, so we have a team of three in our Newport office. Um, so Emily is our program manager. We also have a communications manager who does a lot of our um, work at communicating and messaging to the sailing and boating community. And then we're actually a part of a much larger organization called Oceana, which is the largest international ocean conservation organization in the world. And so their headquarters are in Washington, D.C., and they have offices, I believe, in 13 different countries across the globe. So we have 250 new colleagues. So we joined forces with Oceana in 2018 and have seen significant growth. For our green boaters, we have 50,000 green boaters who are supporting our efforts all over the globe. And like I said, we 850,000 sailors have been participated in Clean Regatta since the, the program was formed. So it's a really great network, and we're seeing... I think as more boaters and sailors are seeing the issues on the water and know that they can make a difference, they're wanting to join us. They're wanting to know the solutions. So just, I've been with Sailors for the Sea for seven years now, and I've seen just different reactions, like so much more involvement. And it's just been really, really exciting to see. So now we championed the cause by sailors. I had a program recently on Sail to Shelter. Angela Abshear has a program where sailors can deposit their old sails, their used sails, to her, and then she uses them to create lean-tos and tents and other kinds of shelter in homeless areas, especially in big immigration camps. It seems to me that you guys can always be working with each other because the more alliances you create with other like-minded, green-conscious, nautical types, the better for your in effect and her in effect. Yeah, so totally. 
Right. We can't, we can't do things alone. Like we, I said, we're a pretty small team for Sailors to the Sea, and we work with a lot of different organizations. And there's so many different challenges that our oceans are facing. And there's just a lot of innovative solutions like that, that sailors and boaters can be a part of. And I think through our Clean Regattas program, we're seeing a lot of innovation, especially during COVID. There was a lot of people that had to come up with ways to accomplish their sustainability goals because they, they were challenged by the, by the pandemic and just other issues of you know, where they're located. So if, you, if you're in the Caribbean, for example, you might not have the waste infrastructure that we have in the United States. So how do you overcome that challenge or sourcing materials. That was a huge, a huge issue. If you don't want single use plastics, like what is, can you order reusables? Saw a lot of innovation, it's just really exciting to, to see the growth and the innovation in the clean regattas world and sailing and boating community. So the more connections we make, I think is the better. We're all achieving, trying to achieve the same overarching goal. So speaking of solid waste disposal, what's happening in China? We keep hearing that all the recycled material that we send to China is actually not getting recycled, ground up, melted down or whatever. Instead, it's going into gigantic, vast junk islands that are filling up with waste. And that ultimately that's going to get back into the ocean. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, I think it's a huge challenge. Like I said, only 9% of the plastic that's ever been produced has been effectively recycled. And I think one of the big issues is the contamination. I think countries that were accepting our recycling before have much higher percentage is that they can't be contaminated. And then what do you do with all of that leftover waste? That's a, that's a really huge issue. So I think that's why Oceana and we work on supporting policies and trying to get companies to reduce. We don't want the consumer to hold the brunt of all of this. Like the companies need to, to come up with ways to, to reduce plastic waste. And we need to put policies in place because plastics are just going to end up in the ocean, unfortunately. And it is challenging to recycle. And like I said, too, there, a lot of the plastics are downcycled into something that's not of the same value, too, which I think is surprising to some people. So on my antique wooden racing boat, youngster, uh, we actually crumple up a paper bag and cover up the top edge of it. And we put junk inside that paper bag. Others have said to me, no, no, why not use this green recycling plastic bag? It's just as recyclable. Is it better to use a paper bag if you can keep the thing dry enough? Or is it better to use one of these recyclable green plastic bags? Are they actually biodegradable? The Quick answer is that usually no, they're not generally biodegradable or they are, but under very specific conditions. So maybe they would biodegrade in an industrial composting situation, but they wouldn't if you send them to landfill. I always say that it's better to use what you have than to buy something new, even if you think that that new thing could be greener. But in this, in this case, I would say your instincts are probably right run and using the the paper is going to allow that to either be effectively recycled or to break down more quickly. Another issue we've had some speakers talk to us about little micro particles settling to the bottom of the ocean and coating different parts of the bottom of the ocean. And they mm -hmm. describe this as a long range insidious problem that we won't know about really much about until uh, it's very, very difficult and very widespread in the oceans and cutting off any bioactivity on the ocean floor. What metrics have you got for the microparticles that grind up on the beach and gradually settle gr with via gravity down at the bottom of the ocean? That's a really great question. I don't have any metrics at the top of my head about the, the number of microplastics. I know a, a decent amount of plastics do sink to the sea floor, and there is concern, but it's really, it can be challenging to study some of these locations because they're underwater, but in plastics have only been around for not that long, but I know there's a lot of people researching the amount of microplastics are in the water um, and their impacts on our oceans and sea life. You know, a lot of animals are eating microplastics and they can absorb toxin, and then we could potentially be eating those through the food chain. So there's a lot of research, but I don't have any specific metrics. Emily, do you have anything? No, I think I would echo what you say, Shelly. And also, this is a really tough problem because the, as you said, Ron, we might not know the impacts until we're pretty far into this issue. And so we're, you know, scientists are studying this as it continues to evolve. But if we're not cutting off the source, then the, the microplastic Aquatic pollution is much 
easier and cheaper to prevent than to cure. It's so much easier to not throw a plastic bottle in the water or to not use another plastic spoon than it is to recover the little micro particles that ultimately end up settling someplace that's hard to get to and expensive to find and remove. Talk to us a little bit about the danger and, and what else you can do to make sure that animals don't get caught up in uh, trap lines. That's a really great point, Ron. That's a, an issue that Oceana is really working on, specifically with the North Atlantic right whale that I uh, showed the picture of. The two leading threats is not only ship strikes, but it's also entanglement in fishing gear. And I think that there, there's a lot of research right now on different types of gear that um, could potentially reduce entanglement, like gear that is remote controlled. So the lines would pop up when you go to collect your gear or they break more easily if they're entangled in whales, for example. They can also do seasonal closures when, like I was saying, some animals are migratory. So there could be closures when certain animals are going to be in that region. So there is a lot of research on gear happening right now. I think there's, there is solutions, solutions out there to protect these, these majestic animals. We've also had a couple of speakers talk about whale strikes, that is to say whale striking back. There was a, a J-35 that got hit in a, a light ship race about 15 years ago and got repeatedly rammed, I think it was like five times on the starboard side as they were, that is it's the whale being on the south and the boat was going uh, eastbound coming back from the light ship and the J-35 got hit like five times by the whale. So the people on the boat were pretty convinced that this whale intended to deliberately hit the boat. W what do you know about whales hitting boats, recreational boats? That's a good question. I've seen a couple news stories. I'm not a whale biologist, so I don't know what their personalities are like or what they're experiencing, but I think them hitting a boat or us hitting them can really be damaging to like scary for them and then for us as well. So I don't, I don't have much information on that, but <laughs> I, yeah. I try, I would suggest staying far away from these animals because you, you have no idea where they're going to be popping up. I could say for those of us in races who see them occasionally, uh, we love it. We love seeing them. And it's very rare that we've heard of anybody, very, very rare, we've heard of a whale hitting a boat. Yep. Uh, and we yep. try to stay clear of them, but you know, you can't tell where they're going to be next when they, when they come up only right. right surface or spout. What's your picture of success? If if we gave Sailors for the Sea an A for 2022, what would you turn and say, ah, this is what did it of accomplishments of what we got done in 2002? Because the Wizzy Yachting Lunch and fans and everybody else to say, good going, you got an A. That is a great question, Ron. I think this year has been a really exciting year for us because Clean Regattas program was really hit by the, the pandemic because a lot of events were canceled. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of events had struggled to, to be able to implement sustainability initiatives because of different health codes and things like that. So this year we, I think, are going to be on track for a number of Clean Regattas part participating in sustainability or in our Clean Regattas program. And I think one of the most exciting things is we described, we had the different levels of clean regattas. And last year was a record for us. We had 11 events that achieved platinum level status. And this year we already have 31 events that have signed up for platinum level. So that just shows how many events in the sailing community that are really focused on sustainability and implementing it at the highest level, which is just, I think, really exciting to see. So we still have a lot of events coming in at the lower levels, but we see as, as uh, St. Francis Yacht Club and as other events, we see them climbing the sustainability ladder, coming up with innovative solutions. So for clean regattas, I think that's really exciting. Exciting. We also, like I said, we have 50,000 green boaters who are supporting us, who are speaking out on issues like plastic pollution and protecting endangered marine life. So it's just, it's been a very exciting and busy, busy year for us. What, what about things that you could do to enable the people who are supportive of you, like uh, yours truly and anybody else who's in the green boating? What if you gave us a little sticker that could go in, in the yacht clubs? It says clean regatta member. And so each yacht club could earn these different levels. And uh, also everybody's got email and everybody's got an email signature. What if we had a little logo that went on the email signature that people could have saying clean regatta participant, and you could touch that button and get 
a link to what more you could do to help clean regattas. What about ways to leverage, in other words, those of us who are sympathetic to this wonderful cause? Yeah, those are two really great ideas. I think we should add you to our, our team, Ron. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think another initiative that we're piloting right now that's actually helping too is we're starting a clean class initiative. So we're working directly with classes right now to help grow our clean regattas program. So we've been working with the Thistle class. They have significantly increased the number of clean regattas. I think in the last year, it was like a 420% increase in regattas participating in clean regattas that were Thistle events. So we're hoping to roll this out with other classes. So if anybody has any interest, we were really looking for classes that are that want to be sustainable, that have network to communicate with organizers. So that's, a, that's another area that we're really looking to grow. And then these people are, are becoming, you know, green boaters. They're kind of like our, our members, but I love the suggestions of having stickers and, you know, promoting what they do. I think the Thistle class on their website, they have our logo next to every event that's a clean regatta. So it's kind of a little bit of peer pressure to convince the other, you know, events, Hey, get on board. And Thistle class members, this is what they're expecting when they go to an event. Like they're expecting to not see single use water bottles. They're expecting to see elimination of different single use items, or it's just, it's, I think we want to see a culture of like, this is what I, as a competitor, when I go to an event, like we should be working to make it sustainable. And I do want to highlight one other really cool initiative is we worked with the Newport to Bermuda race and they started an initiative called the environmental steward. So this is you know, there's the crew position, tactician, they added environmental steward. And so that person's responsible for all sustainability on board. So it's not just the organizers of the events that are working on sustainability, you're putting some of that onus on competitors too. And so we had a ton of competitive boats have environmental stewards on board. And it was really great to see that they focused on it this year. And so we're hoping to roll that out with other events too. It's very exciting. Yeah, you could even have a green footprint award. Yeah. Green footbit of a competitor, which would be pretty good. Speaking of which, as we were talking, I took a drink out of my. Yeah, yeah, my reusable. The St. Francis Yacht Club is an enthusiastic supporter of Sailors for the Sea. And as a formal thistle sailor, it's wonderful for you to acknowledge people who are supportive of your efforts. Anything more that the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon can do, we would like to do. So please get back to us. I could not wish you more success. What you're doing is so important. And recognition of our carbon footprint, every one of us, is very, very, very important. Thanks so much for your, your good support. Uh, please keep it up. And uh, we look forward to hearing back from you in a year to learn what more we can do to keep the oceans healthy and green. Thank you so much. We've really Thank enjoyed you. being a part of today. Thanks very much. Thanks for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.